This interview is the second half of an episode of my new podcast, The Explanation. So if you want to listen to the full episode, be sure to subscribe by clicking the link in the description or on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Hi, Rick. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Well, the first question I want to ask is about the infrastructure bill that the White House is trying to pass right now. The bill allocates about $80 billion for Amtrak, and Amtrak put out this map showcasing what they hope to do with that money with some really exciting routes, a bunch of upgrades and all of that. But what I want to ask you is what you think of that level of spending and what can be done with $80 billion? Is it enough to do what Amtrak says they'd like to do? And how should they prioritize all of these many, many projects that they'd like to do? So, uh, to be clear, uh, the Biden administration proposed $80 billion in spending on railroads, not only on Amtrak. And Amtrak has its own proposal for expanding routes across the country. Um, we are very happy that Amtrak is proposing to expand its route network. Um, we think they've got a good proposal in terms of the map. There's a couple of pieces missing, but we need something that's much more aggressive than what Amtrak is proposing. Mm -hmm. What do you think can be done with that money with $80 billion? How much, how much, how far can that get? Well, so it's a good starter network or a good start mm -hmm. and it could leverage state and private money. Uh, so it's not really clearly defined yet, but it's basically the minimum of what we need to do to get decent train service in this country. Rick, how many jobs do you estimate would be generated by those $80 billion of the infrastructure bill dedicated specifically to, to the rails? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't seen any estimates yet. Gobs, gobs and gobs of jobs would be created. Uh, well, when I was researching this, I, I saw that back in 2010, the $2 billion project for Florida that Governor at the time, Rex Scott, killed would have generated around 27,500 jobs. So like you said, this would generate a t thousands and thousands of jobs. So since we don't know how many those would uh, generate, I have a different question for you because there's a lot of possibilities of high-speed rail projects, but obviously you have to prioritize. Which ones would you prioritize? Which ones would be at the top of your list? So California is under construction. So um, that is an immediate win. A uh, bright line from um, Las Vegas to LA is ready to go. Uh, there's, you know, a couple of not quite high speed rail projects in the Midwest that could be quickly done. But really what we need to do in addition to those quick wins and also some immediate fixes to the existing Amtrak network, we really need to take care of the big high leverage stuff, like the first 90 miles out of Chicago to the east, south and to the north. Um, really getting planning underway on Atlanta to Charlotte. Um, the, the, a couple of critical bridges on the Northeast Quarter. And most importantly, right away, replacing any passenger train in this country that's older than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you talked about that the Amtrak map had a lot of great stuff in it, but you said there were still a few gaps. Could you talk about where you think it should be more ambitious than it is? Uh, the immediate thing that comes to mind is um, Nashville to Louisville, right? So uh, the Federal Railroad Administration did a plan for the Southeast, and they did a plan for the Midwest, and those plans meet at Nashville. And it's very disappointing that Amtrak didn't see that very obvious connection. Is there a model that you would draw from abroad? Uh, people, a lot of times, they give high-speed rail examples of 
great high speed rail systems in countries like France, Germany, um, China, and Japan get brought up a lot. Which one do you think would be the best inspiration for the U.S. to draw from, and like, and what should we be looking at taking from each one? Well, you know, each circumstance is different, and even within countries, each route is slightly different. Each segment is slightly different. Uh, we should certainly take inspiration from Turkey. If Turkey can build high-speed rail uh, from the uh, Mediterranean up that, that really steep climb up to the plateau where Anchor is, we can do high-speed rail in this country. But the key lesson is probably if you look anywhere in the world, there is a solution for the specific problem in your route. So we really need to look at it overall in a big picture way. Is there a more um, a systematic like approach towards high speed rail that any of these countries have that you think we should draw inspiration from in a systematic level rather than looking at it route by route? No, really, the system, the systematic level is the critical piece. And it's part of why we haven't moved forward in this country, because it's all been segment by segment. But people don't travel in discrete city pairs. They travel all across the country. So we really do need a master plan at three different levels, the state, regions, and the national level. And, you know, you're not going to build new high-speed tracks everywhere, but certainly all 49 states on the continent need better train service and including substantial upgrades to the Alaska Railroad. And you're talking about um, the 49 states on the continent. How much do you think that the American high-speed rail network would be integrated with Canada and Mexico, for instance, or even possibly further down into Central America if that's practical? I know Amtrak has some operations in some limited operations in Canada. How much do you think that those should be separate systems compared to how much should they be working together? You know, we built I-69, which in a lot of places was redundant and not needed, but they built it based on this idea of connecting Ontario to northern Mexico, essentially, and everything in between. We certainly certainly should be doing that with high-speed rail, looking at Monterey, Laredo, San Antonio, Dallas, Memphis, Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, Toronto. Montreal. I have a question for you, and I tried to get the answer, but I couldn't find it. So you're like the best person here. I know that in in Europe, for example, there's companies for building uh, highways that they take the cost of building the highway and they recover the costs through tolls. Um, is and since a lot of the argument against building high-speed rail is that it takes a lot more time and it's a lot more expensive than estimates. Is there something similar for building high-speed rail so that a private company could build part of it and, I don't know, make some of the money back from ticket sales or something like that? Well, remember that most highway projects take longer than they were anticipated and have huge cost over. So there's an interchange here in Chicago that is years. And and I had the experience of driving through that construction zone last week. So years behind schedule. That's just part of the way we build highways in this country, right? We put billions and billions of general revenue into the highway trust fund every year so um this the amazing thing is that there are private projects that are willing to compete with the publicly owned and subsidized highway network that just shows how much more efficient high-speed rail is than driving Um, and certainly there are different models in different places but the hardest part always is acquiring the land. And if there is an agency that's building a toll road overseas, typically the government is providing the land. Mm -hmm. So 
With high-speed rail being a lot more expensive than um, other pass non-high-speed passenger rail, do you think in your model would there be a place for I, I what would the word be uh, normal speed passenger rail? I guess uh, like what Amtrak's uh, current offerings are, um, especially for shorter routes. Like if you look at uh, Chicago to Detroit, for instance, that you could potentially get a much cheaper construction, perhaps cheaper ticket prices. Would there be a place for that in your model? So basically. It's going to be about 20% new high-speed track running at 200 miles an hour and 80% working with the freight railroads to run um, higher frequency service at 80 miles an hour. But the difference between what is reasonably achievable on the existing railroad between Chicago and Detroit is about four and a half hours, five to ten times a day. What you get out of dropping that under two hours and having a train every hour, plus a train, an express train during the peaks, uh, half hours, uh, you get 10 times the ridership, 10 times the value. So we re plus, that would be part of, um, if, if you did it the way most people have talked about it, that would be part of Chicago Toledo, Toledo Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit to Cleveland, Chicago, Cleveland, Toronto. So you put a lot of volume over that infrastructure and you can only do that by building new infrastructure in those key places. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how working with the freight railroads would, what that relationship would be like in your estimation? Because I know there are a bunch of issues with the freight railroads and um, prioritizing their own trains for obvious reasons and uh, with who's in control of repairs and um, uh, and all of that. So can you talk about the what the relationship between the probably mostly government sponsored high speed rail would be and the private railroads that they operate on now and it sounds like would operate on under your in your model as well so the fundamental problem with Amtrak today is that they are have legal right to the best service much higher quality than any of the railroads customers and pay dramatically lower rates than any of the railroads customers. That's a fundamental flaw that we have to fix. You can't legislate somebody taking that big of a, um, a hit. And so that's the piece that has to be fixed. How would you look at any proposals to nationalize some of those railroads? Um, it would be incredibly difficult to do, very expensive, um, and it would go against 200 years of history of this country. So um, it, it's an interesting thing to debate. Well, I mean, there are railroads that are owned by the government now, and there is a history of some infrastructure being nationalized in the past. Um, so, I mean, do you think that that would make it do you think that that would be a worthwhile thing to do? Do you think that would improve service or be worth the money? That's really difficult. That's, that's beyond my ability to speculate. But it is true. There are a lot of publicly owned railroads, uh, primarily dedicated to passenger trains. There's a couple of publicly owned freight railroads, actually, Cincinnati to uh, Chattanooga and, and uh, across Northern Carolina. But it, it's just too big of a scale to discuss at this point, but it certainly is one option. Mm -hmm. Rick, I saw some numbers that argue that it costs between one and four cents per driver to invest in highways versus something like 13 cents per rider to invest in, in railways. But we know that there's an environmental cost that I don't know, I don't know, I think it was in, in that equation. So what are your what are your talking points to com like what arguments do you have to combat those those talking points? What can we help people learn to argue against those those numbers? That those numbers are complete baloney. 
So look at, for example, right now, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, $110 billion to add one more lane in each direction on I-5, less than half of that to build high-speed rail. The added lane on I-5 doesn't do much for you. High-speed rail cuts the travel times in half. Um, the people who use those numbers are very selective in the costs, um, and it, it really is belonging. Well, you just picked the right example because I am in Portland, and I drive to Seattle, and it's a nightmare. And you can add more lanes, but there's always this, uh, this pile of cars around Tacoma, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm really happy with the work of Strong Towns, strongtowns.org. They have demonstrated that a, a large part of the reason that our communities all across the country are having such huge fiscal problems is because we've simply built too many roads and it's destroying the finances of our cities and towns. And the people who are advocating for more highways choose not to look at all of those costs. How much, um, how easy is it to affect those? Because you were giving per rider and per driver numbers, Sylvia. So how easy is it to affect those with passenger numbers? You talked earlier about increasing passenger loads with the example of Chicago to Detroit by making it high speed instead of um, a slower train. How much, uh, like, how quickly does that have an impact? Is it um, something uh, on the cost per rider? Does it is it something that works around the margins, or is it something that is one of the main factors in that? Well, the key to running trains is to put a lot of people on, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because that means actually you have to run a lot of trains. But if you look at the California, uh, so you really have to to get across a tipping point in terms of frequency and speed. But once you're there, it becomes very exciting. So just like in the first phase of California high-speed rail, it's very interesting. They're going to double the amount of riders on that system and actually lower the cost of running the system. Because essentially, the first segment of high-speed rail will replace a section of Amtrak service that already exists. And then everything that feeds into that, uh, three different train routes, five to 10 bus routes, they all get increased service as well. And because of that additional frequency, so many more people will ride it that the cost of running the system, even though you're running a lot more trains, carrying a lot more people, actually goes down. So you t you're talking about um, the California high-speed rail. That's one that critics bring up a lot also because the California high-speed rail has been far behind schedule, far over budget, and um, they've been talking about cutting back on what the original plans are. So can you talk about some of the problems that they've, they've run into in California and how would you push back against criticism that leverages uh, the problems they've seen in California as a, an argument that high-speed rail is not worth it? So... Uh, first of all, let's go again to the Jane Byrne interchange in Chicago, which is years behind schedule and over, over budget by a lot. You know what? I'm going to argue that people shouldn't drive because we just can't build highways. That's number one. Number two, the plan is and always has been San Francisco to LA in two hours and 40 minutes. That is under construction now. All that's changed is the phasing of it. And the biggest challenge goes back to the land. And you have to be very aggressive about understanding what land you need and how you're going to get it up front. And that's, that's the key issue. China managed probably the most impressive expansion of their high-speed rail network that we've seen at least very few countries do, if, if not, if there has been any, have been any other countries that have accomplished a similar feat, building tens of thousands of miles of rail in a very short amount of time. 
A lot of people, though, say that that's only possible because of the authoritarian nature of China's government, the ability to dictate to lower authorities and not have to squabble between parties or to uh, try to source funding from state legislatures and such. Um, do you think that it's possible to achieve that kind of feat in civil engineering the way that the American government is structured to, um, to build up a nationwide system in that kind of time scale? And if it is possible with the way the government is structured, is it possible in this current political landscape? So the, the reason we have such onerous environmental regulations in this country is because the interstate highway destroyed so many viable neighborhoods. It destroyed so much natural beauty. And all that the folks in in favor of keeping strong, healthy neighborhoods could do was slow the process down. Um, we really couldn't change the process. So, you know, when we built I-55 here in this state, uh, you, the marshals went in and carried people out of their homes so that they could come in and build the highway. We probably don't have that kind of gumption anymore. But that doesn't mean we can't do high-speed rail right. Um, we can do high-speed rail. And part of the answer is to use where possible. Unfortunately, a lot of places, the highways are too curvy. But there's a lot of right-of-way out there that can be used for doing high-speed rail. Mm -hmm. Rick, for, for those of us who are fans of, of trains and high-speed rails, what can we do? to help? Like, do we contact our representatives and push specific bills? What can we do to gain more support for this and make it happen? So um, right now is when the debate is happening. It's happening now. It'll be happening for the next couple of months. Um, given the way Washington works, it may stretch out, but we're thinking in the next couple of months. Um, and one of the best things you can do, not only get a group of friends who all live in the same congressional district and go meet with your congressman, that's step one. Step two, go to your local mayor and persuade your mayor to get a resolution through the um, city council. Those kinds of things are what we need to do in order to make it happen. Uh, what has your organization been doing to try to lobby the government to invest more in this? Can you talk about some of those things? Really what we've been doing is um, educating people around the country about why this is so important and what needs needs to happen in order to make it happen. Uh, people can get engaged and we can help them know what they can do. Um, if they go to our website, highspeedrail.us. So highspeedrail, obviously, .us, that's where we want it, here for us. Um, and there's a petition they can sign that will also get them on our email list. Mm -hmm. And you seem very optimistic about uh, the prospect of building high-speed rail, but I wonder how optimistic you are about this current push that you said the debate's happening right now, and how much do you think we can get out of that? Is, do you think $80 billion is the top line, is, is the ceiling of what we can get to, or do you think that we can potentially get more than that? Now, just to be clear, um, one thing that happens with these proposals when they're debating them is they give you a top line number and then they don't tell you how many years. So sometimes it's four years, sometimes it's six. You know, in this case, it's 80 billion over 10 years. That makes it 10 billion a year. Um, that really needs to be the floor. We need to be much bigger. We have a crisis in this country. We've got a financial crisis. Uh, we've got an environmental crisis. We need to really reinvent the way we do business. We need to do it now, not 10 years from now. Um, it really needs to happen now. Have you seen leaders that you've been engaging with that are reflecting the same kinds of attitudes? So we're very excited about the administration's push. That's great. Um, Congressman Moulton from the Boston area has, has been the clear champion. Um, uh, uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia from Chicago has been 
uh, a, a huge champion for transit. Um, and um, uh, Costa out of California has been very, very strong. Mm -hmm. Rick, I have to be honest, I was really surprised because when I was researching this, I ran into something completely unexpected, which was that this becomes like a political issue. It never would have occurred to me that this became about politics and that the right argues that cars provide you with freedom and that trains make you, you know, submit to the will of the community and whatnot, and that the Koch brothers have poured millions of dollars into killing these projects. So what is, what is your take on that part? Because I was, I mean, there's even like this war on trains term that I never would have known existed. Yeah. So see, the problem is if you have strangers into mingling for a period of time, they will talk to each other and then they will get ideas. And, you know, maybe they're not listening to talk shows as much and getting the ideas from talk shows. So really, you don't want people intermingling if you're of that, that fear. The other thing is our existing system makes a lot of money for a few people. Um, and it makes a, a decent amount of money for a lot of people. Right. Think about it. There's a tire shop in every congressional district. There's an asphalt dealer. You know, it's it's a system that costs a lot. And because it costs a lot, there's people who make money on it. And um, trains will be much more efficient. And so basically, you're that's the challenge, really, when it comes down. So trains are revolutionary. Trains are revolutionary. Yes. All right. Um, well, before we finish up, do you have anything you'd like to plug? I just, you know, our website again, hsrail.us. Uh, love to hear from folks. Uh, this is really a critical time. Uh, please check it out. Thank Thanks. you. All right. Thank you, Rick. My pleasure.